Hi, it's your Draft House Diary for Sunday, June 11th, 2023, when we came out here to the Alamo at Littleton's Aspen Grove to see Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And with me... I'm I'm not, in fact, the Matthew from Universe 2525. I'm his son, Ian. Hi again. <laughs> and my co-host from the Intermillennium Media Project podcast. That's me. So we'd been looking forward to this movie for a long time. <laughs> uh... Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, a, a genuine achievement in animation. Probably the best animated feature in the last five years, maybe longer. So my hopes were high, and yet I wasn't sure they'd be able to match that bar. I wasn't sure they were going to be able to not repeat themselves. This movie did not disappoint. This movie was excellent. When they, when they said it took five years for them to expand their animation again, I saw it here. There's so many more styles, so many more techniques, a whole new layer again on top of what they'd already set down before. They built on everything they did. In terms of filmmaking, they built on everything they did before and expanded that, did more, found new ways to use animation for a specific kind of storytelling you simply couldn't in other ways. And that extends to the storytelling as well. This was about so many things at the same time. It was so layered. It was about parenting. It was about growing up. It was about choices and responsibility. It was about stories. And yes. the stories we tell each other, the stories we tell ourselves, and the stories we are part of no matter what we do. It was. It was about stories and storytelling. They take the idea of canon, which is so important to comic book fans and fantasy and sci-fi fans and TV fans. They take that idea of canon and they... They expand it while at the same time turning it on its head. They use the idea of canon as part of the power of the story that they're in the process of telling. A lot of multiverse movies right now, because it is a popular thing in the zeitgeist, have a tendency to talk to the audience to explain what it is, to explain what it's doing. This movie, I say, does trust you. It throws some big concepts. It throws all of this at you, but it doesn't doesn't talk down to you and it thinks it knows you'll understand it and you'll understand the part you need to understand honestly that was great yeah. they trust their audience to follow along they don't simplify things they don't over explain they provide enough explanation i'm glad that we rewatched into the spider-verse last night oh that was huge but even if we hadn't this would have been a great and powerful movie there are a lot of references a lot of things mm -hmm. like i say directly immediately built upon into the spider-verse that we got more out of having rewatched it so if you haven't seen across the spider-verse yet uh rewatch into the spider-verse uh, you'll you'll get more out of this if you do. Oh yeah, it's also just wor worth rewatching. Oh yeah, and I honestly think this is this as well is going to be a movie I want to go back and rewatch regularly. No there's, question. There's some movies where just refreshing yourself on it, rewatching it again can be excellent. You pick up on new things every time, and I'm realizing not only do I have one movie like that, now I have two movies, <laughs> and I've got two movies that create almost an entirely another movie's worth of oh my goodness if you watch them both again. Yes. It's like. Oh. <laughs> And that just bewilders me for the fact that there's more coming. Uh, favorite new Spider-Man might be Pav from uh, Moonbotten. I, I, I was certain you were going to say Hobie Brown. Hobie is really cool, but a little more stereotypical. I do like Hobie a lot. Well, he's, and he, I do he, like he, the fact that he looks like he's from a punk rock fanzine. Yeah, he, he wouldn't like you calling him, calling him stereotypical. That's a label. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's so much in this movie, and it... It, it's like it, it took up something that it knew it was being entrusted with and didn't play it safe, but understood it had to do something powerful and important, and it did. Exactly. Well, it's a Draft House Diary, so other parts of our trip. The pre-roll was kind of weird. Very weird. It was expected in that it had lots, it had bits from the electric companies, Spider-Man, it had ads for toys, it had tons of stuff from various kinds of Spider-Man animation and music videos, some and yet, it repeated itself at some point. I can't, like a chunk of it was appeared twice. I cannot tell whether or not this was a a, a like an error that they redid, or it was a an issue of putting this together very quickly, and or 
without spoilers, which I admit can be difficult. Yeah. If you Saying who is in this could have been a problem. So I could see them saying, oh no, here's a big pile of our Spider-Man catalog <laughs> we can't use because we'd ruin it. So they're not trying not to. I'm wondering if that was part of it. I also don't know. I can't tell if I'm giving them too much credit or if they were brilliant. There's something very interesting about saying that something is glitching and having a repeating <laughs> theme in the pre-roll to this movie. I'm like, yeah. was this an error? Was this a constraint or was this brilliant? I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's, I think it's touching how much credit you're giving them to planning all of that in detail. But maybe have, you're right. I have maybe seen you're right. some wildly <laughs> interesting stuff at Alamo pre-shows. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past them but I'm not going to guarantee them that credit. Yeah. But regardless, it was a good pre-show. It was a good pre-show. It, it, it did have a little bit of foreshadowing of some of the stuff in the movie. Not too much. Didn't give, give away plot points. And you know, gets you in the mood for the movie as, as it should. I am glad that they, uh, they didn't go too heavy on the uh, character explanations. They yep. had three of them and they were the, the right ones to explain without diving into every person, every spider person you'd run into. They also just wouldn't have had the time to, but yeah. <laughs> they, they knew which ones to talk about in their pre-roll. They did. And jumping back to the movie a little bit, that's part of what makes this movie work is that Spider-Man specifically is a character who has had so many different versions and also so many different localizations internationally that being able to pull all of this together worked so well. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they hinted at that in the, uh, the pre-roll. Oh, yeah. The food at the Alamo. I had the carnivore pizza, but they were out of pepperoni, which is a weird thing early on a Sunday, but I yeah. guess it was a busy weekend. They were out of pepperoni. They just added some extra sausage to the carnivore pizza, and it wasn't quite as good as usual, but it was very good. Mm -hmm. What did you have, Ian? Uh, I went for one of my favorites and a, something brand new for me. I always love their uh, buffalo cauliflower bites. Those are good. Those are excellent. I was very surprised this time, though. When I asked for it without the vegan ranch, they didn't sauce the wings, the bites at all. They gave me a cup of the sauce on the side instead. Oh. It was a very different experience, but it told me something interesting. Those don't come sauced. Right. And that means there's things they could do with those cauliflower bite, bites more than just buffalo. And that oh. makes me think there's some opportunity there. So if, as now, because they still have the same uh, bonus menu since January, they're still serving those Berber spiced wings. You might be, maybe you could get Berber spiced cauliflower. You might be able to ask for Berber spiced cauliflower. And that I'm would like, be good. Ooh, that's kind of a nice little twist in the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I also got their uh, their breakfast sandwich. The um, I can't remember the name. The uh, the breakfast club sandwich. Breakfast club which sandwich. Has, you know, bacon, egg, lettuce, tomato, aioli, cheese. It was quite good, but I think that just because of how packed this was, mine came out a little cold. But it was still delicious cold. One problem with it, runny egg sandwich, really good. Dark movie theater, really good. Runny egg sandwich in a dark movie theater, kind of difficult. That's a tough one. I'm glad I'm presentable. <laughs> so that's yeah. one of those things where it's like, good sandwich, definitely better if it's warmer. Might not order it again just for the physics of it. And it's nice that that Breakfast Club sandwich is on their regular menu available all the time, because even though this was a 10 a.m. screening, the brunch menu was not available. It was not specifically listed as a brunch screening, so we didn't have access to the French toast dish or the breakfast tacos or things that are only on the brunch menu. That's we could have gotten brunch drinks like Bloody Marys or mimosas, but not the, not the food items. That's something to note. It's interesting that the uh, menus are specific to showings, not specific to times when it comes to something like brunch, which feels yeah. more temporal. And it's a, it was a little surprising because very often I've been to brunch screenings that didn't start until 11, 11.30. They had a brunch screening of, into the, of Across the Spider-Verse at 9.45, but by 10.30, it was no longer brunch. So who knows? But I will say, if they're running out of pepperoni... It could be a supply thing, and I'm not going to jump to say that it's not. That's a good point. There could be things in those breakfast, uh, those brunch menu items that they just didn't have enough of to keep serving them all morning. So, we'll, yeah. we'd have to do more to find out. Right. Well, I think we'll do some more research in the future. Oh, yeah. We'll be back with more Draft House Diaries. And in the meantime, enjoy your movies. And when you do, stay till the end of the credits.